This is The Water Table. A chance to hear the agricultural side of these issues. A place for people to go find information and education. Water management is just going to become even more critical into the future. How misunderstood what we do is. I would encourage people to open their minds and listen to this dialogue. Well, welcome back to the Water Table Podcast. Jamie Dunnick here. Um, We had the opportunity, as you've been listening to these episodes, to go live at the North American Conservation Agricultural Drainage Expo in Des Moines, Iowa, and interview guests. And I was not able to be there, but Carl Getter and Trey Ellis sat in my place, did a great job for the Water Table. And another guest they they were able to interview, Carl was able able to interview, is uh, Matt Helmers, the director of nutrient research at Iowa State University. Matt's uh, been on the podcast before. We've talked with him on the side about different guests. He's been a great uh, cheerleader for the podcast and helping us find guests. And um, so thank you, Matt, for joining us again. But Carl and Matt had an action-packed conversation um, for the water table talking about the work in Iowa and how it's been moving really quickly in the world of bioreactors and drainage water recycling, um, all led by by Matt, his team at Iowa State University. And so lots of exciting things going on. Um, the uh, They also talked about, you know, we get excess water moving downstream in, at springtime, and uh, a lot could change if we could just take a small percentage of that out with what we're doing with drainage water management. So uh, talked about the future of, of water management when you're coming, talking about the types of land values that are happening in Iowa and some staggering prices that we wouldn't have even uh, remotely thought could happen just a couple of short years ago. So great episode again with a lot of uh, knowledge in the room when you get a guy of Carl's experience uh, in the field combined with Matt's experience in the in the classroom and in research. So hope you enjoy this episode on the water table. Thanks for joining us. Well, welcome back to the water table, everyone. We are at the NACADE uh, convention in Des Moines, Iowa. And today we're joined by Matt Helmers. Matt is the director of the Iowa Nutrient Research, research Center. So welcome, Matt. Oh, thanks for having me. Great to be back on the water table podcast. We're uh, great to have you. We are in uh, day number two of the show, right? So things are starting to wind down for the second day. So we appreciate you sticking around and, and visiting with us. So let's uh, let's get started. I'm just curious, what got you interested back in 2003 in in uh, nutrient research, specifically in, in drainage and in water management? Yeah, that's that's a good that's a good question, and I could uh, maybe talk quite a while on that. But you know, I'm I'm a native Iowan, so. Um, you know, the opportunity to come to Iowa State University uh, uh, in a faculty position was, you know, if you're going to do, if you're interested in agriculture and the environment, uh, the upper Midwest and Iowa in particular is the place to be. And so for me to be able to come back to Iowa and work in this in this space uh, has been just really a, a dream come true, I guess. Um, you know, as I think about my interest in this, though, it really stems back to my grandfather farmed. I, I grew up in town, so when people say, did you grow up on a farm, I have to be honest and say, no, I, I didn't grow up on the farm, but I spent most of my, I spent a lot of time uh, on the farm with my grandfather. And uh, certainly one of the things, you know, I, I didn't realize it at the time, but I look back about it, you know, we were we're not on the Des Moines Lobe, where, our, where the, the family farms, but there were still areas that needed drainage. And uh, so, you know, as I look at it, um, a number of years ago, my aunt and uncle uh, gave me a picture of me standing out when my grandfather had two tractors stuck and getting pulled by a third one because of poor drainage on the side hill of one of our farms. So, you know, if I look back at a pretty early age, uh, I realized the, the importance of drainage for our agricultural systems in the upper Midwest. So where was that farm in Iowa? What so it, it's si- Sibley, so Osceola oh, County. Okay. So so uh, I grew up uh, about five miles from Minnesota and 40 from South Dakota, so as about as far northwest as you can get. Uh, so just uh, just a little bit south, southeast of Sibley, Iowa. Cool. As we, as we think about the, the work that you do, um, what was the most memorable 
research project. You started in 2003, right? I did. I started Iowa State in 2003. So 2003, we're in 2023 now. What was the most memorable project that you ever did? Maybe it was challenging or maybe it was fun or maybe it was the most successful. What would it have been? Yeah, so th that's actually a good, a good question. And certainly in over 20 years, we've, we've been able to, I've been fortunate to do quite a few different projects. And so it's tough to, to, to name it. But one of them, and it's not quite as you know related to I think some of the things um, that we're doing now with drainage water management that we'll talk a little bit more bit more about uh, might might top this list at some point in the future. But we did some work. Uh, um, a graduate student that worked with us, Brian Doherty, did some work looking at the timing of manure application. So, you know, in Iowa and, you know, in Minnesota, a lot, too, of, hogs. A lot of hogs, right? And so, can, you know, if we look at the timing of that manure application, can we improve kind of the nutrient use efficiency? And what we found is if we apply that manure, you know, later in the fall when closer to the time when we might put commercial fertilizer down rather than earlier, we can see a pretty substantial yield benefit and we reduce the, the risk of nitrate loss. So I think it's a potential win-win. So that was probably one that, that maybe has um, some of the greatest, greatest impact and, and uh, certainly uh, has been eye-opening when some people see the results because we're you know, sometimes seeing a 40 to 60 bushel corn yield benefit of that later manure application. So in, in today's farming world, right, there's pressure for split applications, yep. right? Yep. So I'm sure that research has been done, but, but uh, how does, in, in relationship to split application, how does that fit in? Yeah, so I think that, you know, um, th there is a lot of interest in split application, we need, and we need to do kind of even more research on that, because we, you know, we're seeing, we see some potential water quality benefits of the split application. We maybe have not seen as much um, water or crop yield benefit as we would we might expect. But uh, one of the things that we're we're working on now with uh, some colleagues in agronomy is looking at can we um, rather than you know automatically putting you know 90 pounds or 50 pounds on split, can we base it on uh, a projection of what that crop may need based on the weather conditions we've had. So if we've had a drier year and we have, we've had maybe less nitrate loss, uh, we might be able to put on a little bit less um, in the crop season and maybe we maintain yield, maybe we even increase it. But even if we maintain yield, but we've reduced the inputs, we've hopefully you know increased the profitability of the farmer. Right, reset your target yeah. basically as you, as you move through the year. Yeah, exactly. So, so that was in 2003, you're doing some, some uh, work on the manure stuff. When did really the focus change to drainage? So, all, you know, all along I've been really fortunate since uh, I came in in 03, and I really need to credit the predecessors to me at Iowa State University, Dr. Stuart Melvin and Dr. James Baker. You know, they had a legacy for, for decades of, of doing some, some drainage water quality research. And so I was able to, to jump in and, and work on some of that, specifically on um, some of the drainage water quality, where we're looking at nitrogen management cropping systems on on nitrate loss. But then in about uh, 05, 06, we were able to start with some controlled drainage, shallow drainage uh, work down in Southeast Iowa, worked with a colleague, Greg Brenneman down there. And, and we had a, a great, uh, Greg really um, uh, worked with the local contractors to get a, a big drainage field day out there that, that people could come in and, and watch the installation of either trenched in pipe or or uh, plow uh, pipe with the, with the contractors. And so that was a great, uh, kind of, you know, as I think back, a pretty um, pivotal moment, moment of, you know, uh, working with, with the drainage industry uh, and seeing something. And then we've been able to get a lot of research off of that site where we're, you know, showing that that shallower drainage placement or controlled drainage is reducing our nitrate delivery out of the drain by about 50% compared to our conventional drainage system. Cool. Right now, you've got a couple of projects going on. You've got saturated buffers. You've got some water recycling stuff. You've got uh, bioreactors and from Sibley County, right? I'm sure the irrigation piece has been dry for the last at least 20, well, more than that, 24, 36 months. Yeah. So, I mean, that's kind of irrigation is hot on everyone's on, you know, top 10 lists. Yeah. Um, where are those projects at right now? Yeah, so, you know, there's a lot of work going on at Iowa State University. Um, colleague Tom Eisenhart's doing a lot of monitoring to help us understand, uh, you know, help uh, stakeholders understand the design uh, and performance of the saturated buffers. And so that's really exciting. Uh, colleague Dr. Michelle Sapir 
and many of her graduate students are work, working a lot on the on the bioreactors and looking at you know how well do they perform, what's the longevity, how can we design them to, to be most effective, and maybe what tree species uh, can be most effective. But as you said, um, we're we're starting some work uh, myself and and with Iowa Soybean Association, Chris Hay, on drainage water recycling. And I like to say you know for for those that maybe aren't as familiar with agriculture, it's a little bit of a rain barrel on steroids. You know we're gonna <laughs> right. we're gonna capture that, that bigger water. barrel. Yeah, a bigger barrel. Yeah, a lot right. bigger barrel, you know, and we're going to apply that water differently. But, you know, when, when we think about, you know, Iowa and Minnesota, upper Midwest conditions, we, every spring, or mo I shouldn't say every, I got to be careful. A lot of springs, we get excess precipitation and, and we have water that moves downstream that if we could keep, you know, a few inches of that, it might be then available for supplemental irrigation uh, for those crops. And as we have potential for wetter springs and drier summers, um, you know, having some more of that water to apply in the summer might provide benefits, as well as if we're keeping that, that water and the nutrients in that water from growing downstream, we'd be having a water quality benefit on, on our downstream resources. But there's a lot of work, in, in my opinion, to look at, you know, as we were talking before, what's the return on investment for that type of system? How do we, you know, schedule the irrigation uh, for those types of systems in Iowa, because we have different soils than, than maybe, you know, in, in the western, western conditions. So um, I think a lot of work there, but I think it's really intriguing as we think about water management and a pretty comprehensive water management system of how do we, you know, slow that flow of water, keep it on our landscape, you know, try to get the greatest, um, you know, the greatest amount of productivity from every drop of water that falls on our land. You know, agriculture is, well, the weather, agriculture and the weather, they're both cyclical, right? So, I mean, you talk about managing, you talk about irrigation. If you think about California, they were in a historic drought, and they're maybe out of, or parts of California may be out of it now, a lot are still in it. You look at the reservoirs that are dried up, and, and then you, you take a look at Minnesota and the areas where we do have water. Now we had a couple of dry years, right? You can start, there's a lot of education that has to take place, um, a lot of learning. Is there anything that we can pull from what they learned out there, pull it to this area, right, to help shorten our learning curve? Because I, as I put my farmer hat on, I think at the end of the day, there's got to be an ROI, right? If it's got to be good for the pocketbook, it's got to be good for the environment, right? It's got to be good for society in general. But at the end of the day, if with land prices at 15, 18, 23, I think there was a 30 up in, up in Northwest Iowa, crazy. So at those costs, right, you can't have a dry year. No, you can't no, have that, a mess. No, right? that, and that's and I think that's why this you know provides us some opportunity because all of a sudden we can you know maybe reduce some of the yield variability and there may be a lot of other implications. You know, if you have this type of uh, implement you know system in there, um, you know maybe there's less uh, susceptibility of having to collect on you know drought insurance and that kind of thing. So you know I think there's a you know we're just kind of getting started. You know, I talked to a colleague of mine from the Ohio State University of Vanessa and, and he's starting to do some work in this. So uh, I'm really excited in the next, you know, the next five to ten years that we'll we'll have a lot more information for farmers and you know in the in the industry. I think they want it today. I'd like to have it today, but we're going to be actively working on it to provide uh, solutions and and uh, provide better information, recommendations on on where this might work and how it might work and, and what might be the return on investment. Yeah, I'm I'm excited about that piece. Um, back to the. You're just uh, in the middle of a big saturated buffer project, a couple of bioreactors. Where does that project stand? So, um, you know, really there's a, a lot of work in central Iowa to, for implementation of those under some batch and build. And so, you know, in Iowa, the Iowa Department of Ag and Land Stewardship has been very um, out front in trying to increase the implementation of some of these edge of field practices, all those as, as well as, as wetlands. And so uh, I think they're getting really, you know, good landowner um, a landowner interest for implementation of those and, and certainly the research is showing that they're they're performing well in reducing uh, nitrate reduction you know kind of a as a little bit of an aside it's exciting to see um, those systems go in for our contractors as well you know so you know the, the folks that are going to be installing those are our drainage contractors and so you know this may give them uh, some um, some work outside of the normal, you know, installation of drainage pipe season. So I'm kind of excited for that and, and to see some of them uh, jumping on board to, to work on installing that. We say quite a bit of work, but maybe you want to explain to our listeners the size and scope of this project, right? Because it's a lot of times I think 
when we think about research work, we think about small plots. So yeah, it worked in five acres. It worked behind this guy's grove, maybe. But just how, I mean, tell, the, tell our listeners just how big this project is. Yeah, so, you know, I think in, in one, they put in about 50 saturated buffers and bioreactors in Polk County one summer. So, you know, and, and really they're looking to scale that up and do that in multiple counties across the state. You know, so as we think about this, um, you know, I think there's a lot of, potential work in the future that it's not just one or two and we're not talking about you know a few acres each of those might be treating a full field you know 50 100 acres type type thing so it's not you know that we're going to put in a couple you know a few drains on on five acres for our drainage research no these are full field scale you know uh, yesterday I talked to a contractor that they said um, they're putting in a saturated buffer and the the lateral on the upstream edge of uh, the buffer was 1,800 feet long. So, you know, a pretty big system, you know, compared to, you know, some of them might be 500 or 1,000, but to see one 1,800 feet long, I think is, is great and will pri- provide a lot of, you know, water quality benefit as that water moves through the, below the, the buffer zone. And I think you've told me before that by scaling this up or bringing the scale larger, you're able to drive the cost down to where it's more reasonable. I, I think that's right because, you know, I, there's going to be, you know, more people to do it. Uh, hopefully more people will become experienced with doing it and also the design can hope, you know, hopefully we can, um, you know, improve the efficiency of the do- design. With this batch and build, you know, they've been able to kind of bundle things together so that it's not a one-off design for a co- for an engineer and it's not a one-off uh uh, build for a contractor. They can. They know that they can mobilize into a certain area. And as I think about it, you know, long ago I worked a little bit in the geotechnical engineering area, and so mobilization to a site could be critical. And so if they can mobilize into a certain area and know they're going to be there, you know, in that general area for you know a few weeks, it seems like it's going to. Uh, uh, lower the overall cost of, of all these installations. Right, just from a contractor's perspective, now they can go into a, an area where they know they're gonna do 50 and they can call someone else to, to kind of know what they're up against. Because before this, it was very small unit. So if I'm gonna do one for 300 acres, 500 acres, even 100 acres, no one really even knew how to bid the job, right? That's, so that's right, yeah. yeah. It's, it, it's a win-win for sure. So looking forward, you know, rubbing the crystal ball a little bit. Uh, what's uh, what's in the hopper? What's 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 to come? Yeah, so that is a really a really good question. So I mean, a couple things. I mean, I'm really I'm really enthused by this drainage water recycling because I just think it's like the comprehensive water management, uh, you know, idea of how, how we can store that water and reuse it. Uh, certainly, you know, um, co- you know. I, I'm fortunate to do a fair bit of work with with others at Iowa State, and they're looking at you know different uh, you know cropping systems, or looking at cover crops, different uh, you know diverse cropping systems. And I think one of the things that is kind of uh, enthuses me about some of those is that I think all of them need aerated soils, and, and drainage is going to be important in those as well. So no matter what we do to solve some of these problems, I think we're you know we're going to grow crops out there, which we're we're going to be doing. I think in some way, shape, or form, we're going to need the aerated soils but you know probably the one that that uh, gets me jazzed when I think about it is uh, is thinking about you know all the research opportunities with the drainage water recycling right and it, and it has the ability to touch things like cover crops because here's not bad but you go up north where I live where I farm and I mean it's really hard to get something started if I could spin a pivot once bingo exactly yeah so you know we've we've seen that you know the last two years in Iowa that you know um, you know just speaking from our own research sites, we've put out, you know, there have been probably three years out of the last 12 that we have put cover crops down in the fall and got hardly any germination, not because of the cold temperatures, but because it was too dry. Right. And if we could just spin the pivot once, I bet we could get that grill started. So I think there's there's way all ways that all these things can work, work together for sure. Absolutely. So let's uh, switch gears a little, a little bit here. So the show we're at today is, is basically a contractor convention or contractor education um, seminars. As a university, a lot of your research is done and it is done between you guys and a grower, right? Yeah. So contractors are always kind of there in the background. How well do contractors um, work with you guys? Do they reach out to you and ask you to do research on different projects? Is it hard to engage them because you know they're maybe not 100% on board with what you're trying to do? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, and and I'll, I'll have to say I think uh, 
I may have, maybe I'm biased and I've been lucky. I've had great uh, relationships with some of the contractors. You know, one of the things um, I still remember back uh, a, a number of years ago when I started at Iowa State, you know, um, had a couple, you know, drainage pipe uh, salesmen that, uh, you know, said, hey, come ride with us for a couple days and we'll just show you around. And so, you know, that was an opportunity for me to go sit and listen, not talk, you know, just listen and, and observe what, what drainage contractors were doing. And, and you know, I uh, great appreciation for, for the work that they do. And, uh, you know, since then, almost every one of our projects that we've been able to do, um, you know, we've been able to do that because uh, a drainage contractor has been you know, willing to engage with the university, whether that's, you know, from simple things like, okay, I'm gonna go through the bid process to install this on the university land, which sometimes is a pain, to being willing to participate in a field day, or, you know, we've had con, you know, we've had a contractor call us and say, hey, you know, we think that it'd be great to see a bioreactor at one of the drainage sites in Northwest Iowa, or one of the research sites at Northwest Iowa, I'm willing to put that in, you know, and, and that they, you know, donated their time uh, to put that bioreactor in because they believed it was important and it, and it gave, you know, it, it was important for Iowa State to be involved, important for them at, within the drainage community uh, to show that they're they're being proactive. Um, and so, you know, I, I, um, I think that, you know, the drainage contractors I've met have been very, very supportive of the work we've done and, and probably, you know, been willing to bear with us. So, you know, I'm, I'm eternally grateful because, you know, uh, any success I've had at, at Iowa State is due to, to many others and definitely including the, the drainage contractors I've worked with. So I, I always enjoy coming to, to, uh, to these events because most of the people you, wit, you meet, you know, they're very applied in nature. They want to see things go on, on the ground and, and uh, um, you know, I certainly like that myself. I thought you were going to say after riding with the egg tile salesman for a day, it solidified your decision to go into research and not into well, sales. Well, well that, that's it. I mean, I'm, I probably will admit I don't have the, the personality for that. So, you know, I, I guess I'm fortunate that we we all, you know, have have skills and, and maybe unique traits. And, and I, I, I will readily admit I would I'm, I am an introvert by nature. And I think to be a, 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 a drainage salesman, you have to be a little bit more on the extroverted side. But, yeah. 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 You have to be something anyways. Yeah. 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 Well, good. Uh, you know, I think all of us in this industry are, are a little bit weird, maybe. I mean, we're passionate about drainage and water management. And and um, I left the industry for about six years and came back. And it's a lot of the same faces. I mean, a lot of the same people are still committed to the same topics. So it it's, uh, it's a fun industry to work in. And uh, we certainly appreciate you coming on the show today and giving us some of your time. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot, Carl. And, and certainly thanks to, to Princo for, for all that you're doing to, to educate folks about the, the importance of drainage and, and kind of you know, what it means to the agricultural community and, and as well as how, how drainage can be part of some of our, the solutions to the water quality issues that we face as well. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. Thanks for joining us today on The Water Table. You can find us at watertable.ag. Find us on Facebook. You can find us on Twitter. And you can also find the podcast on any of your favorite podcast platforms.